Welcome back to this course on nanostructured materials, synthesis, properties, self assembly and applications. Uh, this is the fifth lecture of module 2. Uh, we have earlier done four lectures of module 2 in which we have looked at two synthetic methodologies using the sol gel method and using the microemulsion method. Uh, this lecture uh, we will be starting with CVD technique which is chemical vapor deposition where we will be using this method to make nanostructured films. So, chemical vapor deposition is a process whereby a thin solid film is deposited onto a substrate through chemical reactions of the gaseous species. So, you have a substrate which is a solid and you will have you want to de uh, deposit a thin solid film uh, starting from a chemical precursor from which you generate gaseous species and they will condense onto a substrate and give you a thin solid film which is nanostructured. So, why do we want to study uh, thin films or deposition processes uh, for thin films? Because these single and multi layer films and coatings have lot of applications. We want to synthesize nano layered materials. We want to synthesize optical films for transmission and reflection studies. You can make decorative films for various purposes. You can also make functional coatings which are having say wear resistance or some other function. For all these type of films we can use such deposition techniques like the CVD method. You can also make permeation barriers for moisture and gases, so that they do not enter once you have this coating moisture and gases cannot enter. You can have corrosion resistant films for example, you can have some metals which normally get corroded in oxygen or in the presence of water vapor and if you make a film which is resistant to corrosion, then you can protect those metals. You can make electrically insulating layers for microelectronics. Uh, so, if you have electrical wires which you want to insulate from adjoining wires, you can make insulating layers. You can make coatings of engine turbine blades to enhance their longevity and life. You can coat high strength steels to avoid uh, them becoming brittle uh, using hydrogen. Normally, hydrogen leads to brittleness in the steels. So, you can avoid that by coating some material using the CVD technique. You can make diffusion barrier layers for semiconductor metallization. You can make magnetic films for various kinds of recording media uh, like DVDs or many other kinds of recording media. You need magnetic films and these can be processed using CVD technique. Uh, transparent electrical conductors uh, are required in several places and anti static coatings are required. You can make as we discussed wear and or erosion resistant hard coatings on tools. So, the tools which are used for heavy duty work, they do not uh, get uh, worn off. You can make coatings of certain materials on top of those tools. Then you can make films which can act as lubricants. So, these are called dry film lubricants. Then many other composite films, nano composite films can be made and thin walled free standing structures and foils which are to be used elsewhere, which are very thin can be made by the CVD technique. So, what is this CVD uh, technique that is the chemical vapor deposition technique? What is the principle? So, typically a CVD uh, technique depends 
on the availability of a volatile chemical, which normally we call the precursor, the chemical precursor. It is normally a liquid solution, which can be converted by some reaction into the desired solid film. So, ideally you have a source gas and the source gas undergoes a chemical reaction and forms some monomers. These monomers nucleate to form some oligomers here and this, this is one process where the oligomers can coagulate and condense become large particles and they undergo Brownian diffusion etcetera and thermophoresis and then fall on the substrate or they can be these monomers which form from the chemical reaction of the gaseous phase. This can be targeted using ions and that is called ion induced nucleation. So, you target these mon monomers which are formed from the gas phase uh, of which has been generated from your initial volatile chemical that if you bombard with ions you get ion induced nucleation and this ion induced nuclei, nuclei are charged particles and then you can apply an electrostatic force on the charged particle and direct them onto this substrate. So, by that method also you can make a coating. So, you have this substrate, a substrate can be a disc which is polycrystalline or which is single crystalline and on top of this substrate these molecules will start adhering and condense and will result in a thin film. Now, the various steps that occur uh, in a CVD process both physical and chemical steps are as follows. You have mass transport of the reactant gaseous species. So, that volatile precursor uh, gives out gaseous species and these gaseous species are transported. So, there is mass transport near close to the vicinity of the substrate. So, that mass transport is important. So, you have to move these uh, gaseous molecules which are coming from the precursor uh, which may be a liquid which is a normally liquid or a solution and then those gaseous molecules are transported close to the substrate. Uh, the next thing is diffusion of these reactant species through the boundary layer to the substrate surface or homogeneous chemical reactions to form intermediates that is another part of the CVD process and then adsorption of the reactant species or intermediates on the substrate surface. So, these uh, mainly are some of the key steps which occur during the CVD process. After that you may have surface migration that means, the uh, clusters or monomers or oligomers which are coming onto the substrate migrate on the surface of the substrate they may undergo heterogeneous reaction, they may have inclusion of coating atoms into the growing surface and it may also form byproduct species. These byproduct species are then desorbed from the surface and then diffusion of the byproduct species to the bulk gas and transport of the byproduct gaseous species away from the substrate through an exhaust. So, these are subsequent steps after the uh, charged nuclei or neutral monomers or oligomers come onto the substrate surface, then these surface migration and subsequent reactions uh, and the desorption of the byproduct uh, take place. And the byproduct has to be eliminated or transported away, away from the uh, substrate. Now, if you look at the uh, instrumentation uh, required for chemical vapor deposition, you have the, your uh, gas or the source for the vapor. Or, so, it may be a liquid or some source and there is a panel where you use for purging and 
then you come it goes through some meters where you can control the flow of the gas in or out. So, there is this in and then it is out and then again the gas is sent to the final deposition chamber where the substrate or the wafer uh, if it is a silicon substrate or a silicon wafer we call or it can be a quartz substrate there can be many substrates they are in this deposition chamber. So, the molecules have to come from the specialized gas a liquid uh, which if there is a liquid then you have to the gaseous molecules have to be generated and then go through this uh, various valves where you can control the flow of the gas inside the deposition chamber. And typically there are two types of transport analysis one is when the reactant uh, which is coming out uh, and the reactant which is going in the ratio is nearly uh, 1 is to 1. So, that that is called a differential reactor. However, if the reactant coming out is much less than what is going in then it is called a starved reactor. Okay. So, this gas in and gas out the ratio of this uh, leads to these two terms the differential reactor and the starved reactor and the, uh, the uh, exhaust gases are taken out from the exhaust pump and if they are toxic they have to be treated in the waste treatment before releasing uh, less toxic gases uh, outside. So, this is a schematic uh, diagram of a typical chemical vapor deposition process where you have the gaseous source the walls and the deposition chamber the exhaust and the release of the waste gases. Now, uh, to understand the uh, physics and chemistry of the chemical vapor deposition we have to undergo or, or understand some of the basic principles of physical chemistry or gas laws which are involved during this uh, process of the gas molecules uh, going on top of the substrate and what kind of nucleation or uh, uh, whether it is homogeneous or heterogeneous uh, nucleation and how the growth of the film takes place etcetera. So, the basic concepts in uh, in CVD start from uh, uh, approximating the gases and the vapors that you use to be ideal and so they obey the ideal gas law. So, this is an approximation uh, and the ideal gas law as all of you know is P V is equal to N R T where P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles of the gas, R is the universal gas constant and T is the absolute temperature in Kelvin. So, the units are important. So, when you are taking volume in meter, so the volume unit is meter cube and then you have to take the R the gas constant in SI units which is 8.3 joules per mole Kelvin. So, these are typical uh, uh, I, uh, typical quantities one needs to know to apply the ideal gas law which is important from uh, under, for understanding CVD process. The gas flow uh, as you know you will have to flow gases through these walls etcetera. So, that gas flow is very important and that gas flow are usually measured and reported as either standard liters per minute which is SLPM or standard cubic centimeters per minute which is SCCM. So, these commonly you will find numbers so many SLPM, so many SCCM. So, these are units to tell you about the rate of flow of the gas going through the reactor. So, uh, SLPM and SCCM both uh, are related to the gas flows and they measure gas volume at 0 degree Celsius and 1 atmospheric pressure. So, these are measures of the molar flow of gases through the reactor. An important consequence of the ideal gas law uh, is 
for C V D reactors is that volume flow increases tremendously for the same molar flow at low pressures. So, volume flow will increase significantly uh, at low pressures at the same S L P M. So, if you have uh, the same S L P M that is the same flow a uh, standard liters per minute same S L P M, but you change the temp pressure from high pressure to low pressure the amount of volume flow will increase tremendously. There are some other uh, useful conversions one uh, needs to know which are normally available in uh, textbooks or in uh, all kinds of uh, manuals where C V D is discussed and these are uh, present in many other textbooks of physics and chemistry uh, or material science and one needs to know these conversions because many times you have to convert. Uh, pressure say from atmospheres to tor or to pascals and uh, you need to know this conversion factor. So, this is for pressure, volume and uh, then you have uh, 1 cc is equal to how many moles at STP. Uh, similarly, uh, this rate of impinging suppose you have how many moles per centimeter square is falling in 1 minute. So, that is uh, this number 1 a per minute how many molecules or moles per unit area is falling per minute on a particular substrate uh, that is given by this quantity. And uh, what we just described the gas flow uh, as 1 S L P M and 1 S C C M uh, they are given here and you see 1 S L P M and 1 S C C M are different and they are 1000 times different. This is 1 S L P M is 1000 times 1 S C C M. Okay. Now, some other useful conversions are between the Boltzmann constant K and the uh, universal gas constant R, which can be written in several different uh, uh, units and one has to be careful when you are doing mathematical problems or converting uh, uh, numbers from one unit to another unit. You need to be careful what to take the value of r. The value of r can be uh, 8.3 or 62 depending on what units you are taking. And so, these conversions are useful in doing some calculations with respect to pressure volume and basically using the ideal gas law to understand the uh, gas flows etcetera. Now, the next thing that we try to understand because gas molecules will be flowing. So, we have to understand the velocity of these molecules assuming that this is an ideal gas and hence it will have a Maxwellian velocity distribution. And so, it that is given by the uh, rate of change of the number of molecules where n is the number of molecules uh, as uh, with respect to velocity that is given by this quantity. And as you see there is a term where temperature to the power minus 3 by 2 and also there is on the there is an exponential with minus 1 by t. So, if you this is the Maxwellian velocity distribution and this will be the distribution of the gas molecules. Uh, assuming that it is an ideal gas. And from there we can calculate the mean velocity of these molecules which is given by C mean to be the square root of 8 R T by pi m. And for this R must be in joules per kilogram per mole. Now, from this then we can calculate the number of molecules which are falling on a plane uh, which is uh, say 1 square centimeter and in 1 second. So, the that can be calculated as j which is the number of molecules impinging on a plane per square centimeter per second and that is given by this number uh, n c mean by 4 and where, where this small n is the molar volume 
and c mean is the velocity here the mean velocity uh, divide by 4 will give you the number of molecules which are falling on a plane per square centimeter per second. Now, from that we can calculate something which is very important or uh, which is the maximum possible deposition flux for a given partial pressure. So, given a partial pressure P, what is the maximum deposition flux that we can have and that is J is given by this equation and if you know at some pressure P and temperature T for a gas uh, where with a molecular weight m which is given in grams per mole, you will have the J which is the maximum possible deposition flux by this equation. Now, the another quantity which is important is the mean free path of each molecule that is the distance the molecule travels before it is uh, hit by another molecule. The mean free path given by lambda is given by this equation, where the mean free path is now uh, inversely proportional to the square of the molecular diameter and also to the inversely proportional to the mol molar volume. So, n is the molar volume and alpha here is the molecular diameter and the mean free path is related to it. That means, the smaller the molecular diameter, so smaller the molecule, the larger will be the mean free path. That means, the molecule will be moving without collisions for much longer distances if the molecule is smaller. Right? Similarly, the molecule will be moving much uh, longer distances uh, if the molar volume uh, of the molecules is smaller. So, lambda the uh, mean free path is inversely proportional to both the molecular diameter and the molar volume. Now, from these we can now compare uh, some situations like if you compare uh, three different pressures for the same gas, you have a pressure of 0.1 torr, 10 torr and 760 torr. So, if you assume these three pressures, we can calculate what will be the density is of this order and the mean free path for at this pressure is around 500 microns whereas, at a higher pressure of 760 which is normal atmospheric pressure, you will have a mean free path of around 0 0.07 microns which is equal to 70 nanometers. So, as the pressure is increasing the mean free path is decreasing. Similarly, the mean velocity uh, it is kept constant at 47000 at these pressures and you can calculate how many molecules will be impinging on a surface under these different pressures. So, at low pressures you will have less number of molecules impinging per second uh, which is say of the order of 10 to the power 19 whereas, at atmospheric pressure at 760 millimeter pressure of the same gas keeping the mean velocity same you will have uh, 10,000 times more molecules. Uh, impinging on the surface. So, if we depending on the number of molecules which are falling on the surface per unit time, if that is large then the growth rate will be larger and that is seen here uh, the number of molecules falling on a surface per unit time here is much less than here and you see the growth rate how much thickness the film grows per minute that is the thickness is in microns. So, how many microns per minute does the film grow uh, can be compared under these uh, three conditions of 0.1 torr of pressure. You have 10 micron thick film growing per minute. If you increase the pressure to 10 torr, this thickness uh, goes up to 1000 micron per minute and at atmospheric pressure it is an enormous number of 77000 microns per minute. So, you have kept the same mean velocity, but you have changed that pressure of the gas and the other parameters change and 
finally, what is in uh, what you require is the film and the thickness of the film is you can control by controlling the partial pressure of the gas. So, this slide shows you how some of these numbers change by changing the uh, partial pressure of the gas. So, as you are going from low pressure to high pressure, you can change the thickness of the films, which is the right control that you want on the growth of the films using the CVD technique. Now, the growth rate uh, that we just now discussed uh, shows, this is the key point it shows with those numbers is that high pressure leads to high growth rate. So, at one thing what we have kept here is a mean velocity of around 47,000 centimeters per second. Now, what it really means 47,000 centimeters per second means that a molecule will cross a 1 meter chamber. So, if you have a 1 meter uh, chamber in which you are doing this experiment, the molecule will be moving uh, if you say at 2 meters per second. So, in 2 meters, uh, uh, 2 millisecond, a 1 meter long uh, chamber, a molecule will be moving in 2 milliseconds at 1000 miles per hour. So, that would be the speed kind of speed if you trans uh, if you change the units here of from 47,000 centimeter per second uh, to miles per hour, you will get uh, a speed of around 1000 miles per hour. So, this uh, is the kind of uh, speed of molecules that you are talking when you are studying the impingement of gaseous molecules on the uh, substrate or on the target. Now, the impinge, impingement limited growth uh, greatly exceeds actual growth rates. That means, whatever we are calculating uh, is much larger. So, what we are showing here is say 10 microns per minute. This is the calculated uh, growth rate. In reality, this will be lesser in actual uh, experiment. And the reason is that the actual deposition uh, uh, will not be the same because the partial pressure at the surface uh, will be less than the pressure uh, inside total pressure inside the gas. The other probability is that there can be uh, the incorporation of the gaseous molecules onto the su surface is small. So, there are two things uh, one that the partial pressure what we are assuming uh, for the total gas is not same and the actual partial pressure at the surface is much lower or the probability of incorporation onto the surface of these uh, gaseous molecules is small. The other thing that we have to discuss, so uh, we discuss some fundamental concepts using Maxwellian uh, distribution of the velocities of these gaseous molecules and assuming uh, ideal gas behavior. Uh, then we also have to consider the thermodynamic aspects. So, if some chemical reactions are going on, uh, we have to incorporate uh, the Gibbs free energy function, which is G and G is a function of enthalpy and entropy, which is S and uh, the relation between free energy, enthalpy and entropy is given here, uh, where T is the temperature and by the second law of thermodynamics, a spontaneous reaction will occur at a pressure P and a temperature T uh, kept constant, if the free energy is less than 0. So, this is a standard second law of thermodynamics. So, if you have any chemical reaction, which is going to happen during the formation of the film, it has to obey this relation of the free energy going to be less than 0. And the free energy calculation is done typically like this. For example, consider a reaction where a gaseous uh, molecule of A, n moles of A react with m moles of another gaseous system B to give p moles of a solid say C, which is the thin film which will form and r moles of another gas say D. Now, the delta G or the 
change in the free energy or the change of the free energy of the reaction is the free energy of the product minus the free energy of the reactants. This is the standard free energies delta G is not delta G not and that can be equated to minus R T L n uh, the product of the activities of all the products divided by the product of activities of all the reactants. So, if there are two products, so it will be A 1 and A 2 multiplied and if there are two reactants say A 3 and A 4, so this is A 3 multiplied by A 4 that means, the activity of 3 and activity of 4 and that gives rise to an equation like this. Uh, this from here you come here because you have been given this uh, reaction. So, if A is say water and B is ammonia, then accordingly you have to choose uh, the concentration or activity of water and ammonia raised to the stoichiometric or the, or the mole ratios uh, in which they are reacting. So, here n moles are reacting. So, the activity of A will be raised to the power n where n is the number of moles of A reacting with the number of m moles of B. And so, here in the product of the activities you will have B to the power m. The other important uh, thermodynamic aspect is well known uh, chemical equilibrium principle given by Lee Chatelier that if the conditions of a system initially at equilibrium are changed the equilibrium will shift in such a direction as to restore the original conditions. So, what happens typically in reactions where gaseous molecules are involved, you can assume this reaction which is well known reaction for the ammonia formation where all the three uh, the reactants and products are gaseous species. So, you have nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas and ammonia gas this reaction at under high pressure is moves the equilibrium towards the right side and at high temperature it moves the equilibrium towards this side. So, that is basically Lee Chatelier's principle because it says that the equilibrium will shift in such a way if you change something. So, you change pressure you go from one pressure to higher pressure the equilibrium will shift and more of ammonia will be formed from nitrogen and hydrogen if you lower the pressure or you increase the temperature, then some of the ammonia will dissociate to give nitrogen and hydrogen. That means, the equilibrium is shifting to the left side. So, this is a very important uh, principle given by Lee Chatelier and is very important wherever gaseous species are involved to understand how the chemical equilibrium will shift in the when you change uh, pressure or temperature in a particular manner. Now, you can write down these reactions which are the law of mass action for the forward reaction and the reverse reaction and you can write down the at equilibrium the forward reaction will be equal to the backward reaction. And uh, this is an example of that uh, that was a rea uh, one example we showed was nitrogen and hydrogen reacting to give ammonia and this is another reaction where hydrogen and iodine are giving you hydrogen iodide and the reaction is basically due to the collision of hydrogen and iodine molecules and the rate of reaction how fast the reaction will happen is proportional to the number of such collisions and the number of pro collisions is proportional to the density of the hydrogen gas and the iodine gas. So, the density is proportional to pressure and hence finally, it boils down to that the reaction rate is proportional to the partial pressures of hydrogen and iodine. And this is the reaction rate where the reaction rate is proportional to that means, you can write it is equal to a constant k 1 and multiplied by the partial pressure of hydrogen multiplied by partial pressure of iodine that will give you the rate of the reaction. So, the partial pressure of the gaseous species is important. Now, similarly the reverse reaction rate will depend on the reverse constant the k minus 1 
and will depend on the partial pressure of H i uh, which is in equilibrium. Now, uh, we can define this uh, just like we defined earlier the equilibrium constant which is a function of temperature taking a ratio of k minus 1 by k 1 and being shown by this uh, the partial pressures of uh, the product and in the reverse reaction the product is hydrogen and iodine gas divided by the partial pressure of the uh, reactant gases. In this case it will be hydrogen iodide. So, you can uh, write down this kind of reactions and find out the equilibrium constants of course, which is a function of temperature. So, at a particular temperature you will have one particular equilibrium constant. Now, uh, this law of mass action can be rewritten in terms of partial pressures and uh, the partial pressures of this re particular reaction where this is equal to A 1 small a 1 multiplied by capital A 1 plus small a 2 multiplied by capital A 2. This can be rewritten as a product of the pressures raised to the powers of these coefficients a 1, a 2, a 3 etcetera and that product will give rise to the uh, equilibrium constant at a particular temperature. So, uh, if you continue on this, this product which is equal to the equilibrium constant uh, for ammonia, uh, we can rewrite this like this and from instead of activities, then we choose concentrations uh, for uh, certain cases where we can take the activity to be equal to the concentration. We can rewrite this equation in terms of concentrations and uh, you can find out that the K is related to the concentration of the nitrogen and hydrogen and ammonia by P square. So, an increase of P here means increase of ammonia. So, if you increase P, the concentration of ammonia will increase and this is in accordance with Lee Chatelier's principle. Ultimately, delta G of naught of course, is given by minus R T L n K or minus delta G naught is given by R T L n K. This is a very useful equation. Now, to understand the mechanism at the equilibrium, we used we understood this reaction of n moles of A plus m moles of B reacting to form P moles of C and R moles of D. We used the fact that the equilibrium vapor pressure of a gas over its condensed phase uh, is determined by the minimization of the free enthalpy or the Gibbs free energy. Okay. Now, so this can be shown in this way, this is the mechanistic pathway where you have this A uh, molecule interacting with B molecule and it undergoes a bimolecular association reaction and it forms a transition state. Uh, which is in quasi equilibrium with the reactants. So, you have A and B forming this transition state where A and B are collided. Now, the, the next step the, from the transition step where A and B have collided, there can be two ways that the reaction can proceed. One is it may dissociate back to give you A and B or it can because this has some extra energy than A plus B, this can transfer its energy to some other molecule and the entire unit can remain as such which is C. So, the uh, third atom which is M here can collide with the transition state and take away this excess energy and give back this uh, new product which is C which is a combination of a and B or the other simple way is it falls back to the original state of energy with A and B dissociated. So, if you fall from the transition state you can go back to the original reactant state or from the transition state you can go to the product which is a new molecule by the interaction through a third molecule which takes away part of its energy. 
Now, there are various uh, methods of doing CVD. One is the pyrolysis method and then you have a reduction, uh, then oxidation and compound formation. You can have disproportionation reaction or reversible transfer reaction. So, there are variety of uh, methods by which you can do this chemical vapor deposition techniques. So, if you take the first case uh, which we said the pyrolysis reaction. So, this is a typical pyrolysis reaction where you want to make polysilicon. Okay. So, you take a gaseous species this is called silane silicon uh, there are S i H 4 and when you heat it at 600 degree Celsius then it will give rise to silicon and hydrogen. So, basically uh, you are heating this gas molecules over a substrate and uh, this decomposes to give you silicon which forms the film on the substrate and this hydrogen gas has to be taken out as an exhaust through the exhaust. So, this is a typical reaction where a pyrolysis is taking place that means breaking down of a compound under some giving some heat that means at high temperatures you are breaking this up to give you these molecules. These molecules will sit on the uh, will be transported to the substrate and form the film. So, this is a CVD process uh, which uses pyrolysis reaction. Then uh, coming to an example for a CVD where a reduction reaction is taking place can be seen in the case of tungsten metal preparation. So, W is a, the uh, uh, symbol for tungsten and you start from a gaseous species uh, hexafluorotungsten, uh, tungsten hexafluoride and you because this is a reduction reaction the name. So, you heat in the presence of hydrogen and you get tungsten which deposits on the substrate and H f forms during the reaction and this hydrogen fluoride gas is then taken out through the exhaust. So, this is a reaction where there is a reduction of the reactant to give rise to the product which then is deposited or as a thin film on the substrate. This is the third example where uh, you are doing an oxidation reaction. Uh, to prepare a film using the CVD technique uh, and the example here is of aluminum trichloride. Uh, you are using hydrogen and carbon dioxide to oxidize aluminum chloride to aluminum oxide and carbon monoxide and HCl gas are formed. So, these two are gases and this is the only solid material. So, this will deposit on the substrate and give you the film. So, uh, you are using an oxidation condition to make aluminum oxide or alumina films from aluminum chloride uh, and this is again a typical uh, chemical vapor deposition process is aluminum chloride uh, molecules will be deposited on the substrate. The next uh, methodology is the compound formation methodology, where uh, the example that we show here is of titanium tetrachloride reacting with uh, methane. So, there are two gases titanium tetrachloride and methane which are brought together near a substrate and at a temperature of 1000 degree Celsius and at that temperature titanium carbide which is a solid will deposit on the substrate and form a film. So, this is an example of a CVD procedure where you have a compound formation uh, starting from two gaseous uh, precursors and they interact and form a compound which deposits on the substrate and forms a thin film of titanium carbide. The next example is a disproportionation reaction as you understand from the word 
disproportionation means it is breaking up. Uh, so, it is a chemical reaction in which you the same chemical more from a more scientific point of view a disproportional reaction is basically the substance itself acting as a both oxidizing and reducing agents. So, you start with two moles of germanium iodide one of them oxidizes the other and the other one reduces the other. So, G E I uh, where germanium is in oxidation state 1. Uh, when two molecules of G E I come together in the gaseous state, they react and these G E I molecules uh, then disproportionate. That means, one of them becomes higher or becomes oxidized to G 2 plus and the other germanium uh, gets reduced to G 0. So, here disproportionation the word is used because you are having a metal ion in a particular oxidation state. In this case, it is in plus 1 oxidation state in germanium iodide molecule, which disproportionates that means two molecules of germanium iodide both having plus 1 ions will give rise to one ion of 0 oxidation state which is the metal and which deposits on the, on the substrate and forms the film of germanium and the other germanium from here becomes germanium plus 2 and reacts with iodine to form germanium iodide or diiodide I should say. And this germanium diiodide is a gaseous species and is taken out of the exhaust. So, that is why this reaction is called a disproportional proportionation reaction because from 2 plus 1 species we are getting 1 0 valent species and 1 divalent species and this 0 valent species deposits on the substrate and gives you a film of germanium on the substrate. So, this is a CVD technique to make to coat germanium films on several substrates. Similarly, you can coat aluminum, boron, gallium, a large number of other metals and non-metals uh, solids on uh, substrates as films using this disproportionation uh, CVD method. Then this is an example of a reversible transfer. So, here what we see is that you have a gas molecule, it is a tetramer, uh, four atoms of arsenic are there in this cluster two atoms of arsenic are there in this cluster. So, it is a tetramer and a dimer uh, and they react with uh, gallium chloride, where gallium chloride is uh, here having plus 1 oxidation state. And this gallium chloride in the presence of hydrogen uh, at 750 degrees centigrade gives rise to gallium arsenide. And gallium arsenide as you know is one of the most well known uh, materials for semiconducting devices and has a lot of applications and this technique has been used in the CVD technique where it is a reversible transfer because if you use 750 degree centigrade you can go from the left side to the right side where you produce gallium arsenide on the substrate as a film it is a solid and you get HCl gas. Now, if you start from this side, you start with gallium arsenide and HCl and heat at 850 degrees, you will get back the arsenic and the gallium chloride. So, that is why it is called reversible transfer reaction, but it is a CVD technique because you are starting for molecular precursors and ending up with a solid film on a substrate. Now, so we saw that there are a lot of precursors which are used, which have which are either gaseous molecules or they are gaseous uh, which are pressurized into liquids and then gas molecules come out of them and can be controlled before they are uh, sent to the reaction chamber. Now, the one of the important re, uh, requirements for this precursor which is either the pressurized uh, gas as a liquid or just the gas is there should be sufficient volatility to achieve acceptable growth rates at moderate evaporation temperatures. That means, 
the volatility of that liquid uh, or uh, to form gas should be very high. Otherwise, you will need high temperatures to volatilize gaseous molecules from those liquids. So, this is a very important requirement for the uh, precursor uh, that it should be very highly volatile uh, or, or sufficiently um, uh, volatility should be there uh, to allow for gaseous molecules at moderate temperatures. You do not want to heat them at very high temperatures. Of course, you do not even want them to be uh, very volatile uh, that comes to the next point. These should be stable, so that decomposition does not occur during evaporation. So, the molecules which are going should not decompose while moving close to the substrate and they should uh, be able to be transported without any decomposition from the point of entry to the reaction chamber to this uh, vicinity of the substrate. They should be stable and should not decompose. And uh, so, this is the same thing. Uh, we are mentioning that the stability should be high and it should not decompose while evaporation. Some other requirements are like there should be high chemical purity, uh, the, there should be clean decomposition without the incorporation of residual impurities and there should be good compatibility with co-precursors during the growth of complex materials. So, this means that suppose you are trying to grow uh, a bimetallic film. So, you have a precursor for one metal and you have a precursor for another metal, then that is called the co-precursor and during the growth of this complex metal film, uh, there should be some compatibility within these uh, precursor molecules. So, good compatibility with co-precursors during the growth of complex materials. So, materials which have two metals or three metals or two metals uh, and oxygen or carbon uh, carbon dioxide has to be injected to make a carbide or nitrogen for a nitride. So, these uh, co-precursors should be compatible among themselves. This is an important point. Of course, I mentioned about high chemical purity and also uh, the clean decomposition. There should be no other impurities which solidify on the surface of the substrate. Now, so uh, they should these precursors again talking of these precursors because this is the most important thing in the CVD process uh, should have long shelf life with a lot of stability at ambient conditions and should not be affected by air or moisture. They should be able people should be able to manufacture them in large yield at a low cost and they should be non hazardous or with very low hazard risk. So, uh, if you have to make an industrial uh, um, process, you have to consider all these points for making uh, CVD films using molecular precursors. Now, the type of materials normally used for uh, uh, deposited by CVD techniques have applications in several areas of technology. Microelectronics is one of the most important areas where CVD techniques are used, optoelectronics, protective and decorative coatings and optical coatings. All of them uh, some time or the other people use CVD processes to make films which will be acting as components or devices in many of these applications. And with this I uh, come to an end to the lecture 5 and we will be continuing our uh, discussion about various methods of deposition of films, uh, nanostructured films by different methods in the coming lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you.